Come into the parlor, there's a welcome there for you. And if your name is Timothy or Pat, so long as you come from Ireland, there's a welcome on the mat. If you come from the mountains of Morn, Lord, you <laughs> Who? Me? Yes. Yes. King Edward Carson. I was once given or uh, accorded that honorary title. Well, well, it's a step up from Lord and a far cry from Neddy, dear which is what my dear mother used to call me when she sent me off to school each morning from Harcourt Street in Dublin. I've been called a lot of other names since then. Good, bad, never indifferent. Let me see. He's a rattle decaying old pharaoh, Carson is. Ah, Carson. The Dublin dandy with vinegar for blood. I've been accused of fanning the flames of moribund, militant Fenianism. That the sound of my voice alone was enough to get grown men to run illegal weapons by the light of an Ulster moon. But me, the King of Ulster, even Mr. Parnell now, he had his uh, say, Mr. Parnell, Edward Carson, ladies and gentlemen, Edward Carson has no country. He has no caste. He has no identity. <laughs> He's the stage Irishman par excellence. Ah, uh, thank you, Mr. Parnell, for that ringing denunciation in your well-rounded Irish brogue. So you see, I can confirm the great Dr. Johnson's belief that we Irish do not speak well of each other. But me, the King of Ulster? <laughs> Just imagine me, old raw bones, born and bred in the second city of the glorious British Empire, a broth of a boy from Dublin, lording it over an anxious tribe of once proudly dissident Presbyterians. I do know. That would not do. I couldn't accept such a gracious offer, however symbolically made. Symbols, totems, sacred cows, Finn McFool, Kathleen the Hooligan, and Billy the Flying Dutchman. There's nothing we Irish won't wrap around ourselves or march behind to assert our superiority over the other fella. He's a sea green incorruptible, that's what he is, a sea green incorruptible, my bosom buddy, and proposer of tonight's radical agenda, that this ancient historical society at Trinity College in this year of our Lord, 1872, proposes the abolition of capital punishment throughout the realm. <laughs> Fit to stand with all our old boys, Burke, Sheridan, Goldsmith, Wolf Tone, Robert Emmett, the scourge of Cromwell too. Ha <laughs> ha, fresh from giving a traditional Irish welcome to the new Lord Lieutenant. Boom, boom, boom. I give you raw bones, or to give him his more honourable title, Ned Carson. Now, Arguing in opposition to Ned Carson's proposition is the library limpet and treasurer of the society himself, old carrot top, uh, the Honourable Bram Stoker, who says, by the way, that some of you boyos out there have not paid your dues. So cough up now. Or he'll be after you as one of these dark nights after lights out. <laughs> ah, lovely laughing Jimmy Shannon. 
Ah, he was the best pal a man could ever have. After Trinity, we went into the law together, to the hallowed halls of the four courts and the bridewell, with four compulsory visits to the Inns of Court in London. Yes, to tug our forelocks to our betters, uh, Ned, you say. Yeah, you know, Ned, I always get the impression they can't wait to see the back of us in the Inns of Court in London so they could count the spoons afterwards. Ha, ha, ha. Ah. Well, back home in Ireland, we were going to champion the rights of the common man. And there were an awful lot of new rights to uphold now. Absentee landlords. They were be now being held to account with retrospective legislation after the famine. Yes, putting a stop to the eviction of poor tenant farmers by absentee landlords. Well, it wasn't an easy living. Scraping by on tuppenny halfpenny briefs. I mean, I mean, hardly enough to uh, raise a family on. For by then I had met Miss Annette Kerwin at a regatta in Kingstown. We got married, and I came back from London, me honeymoon, with a tanner in me pocket to start married life. Fortunately for me, I found myself in great demand. Yes. Defending the absentee landlords. Ah, you dirty sewer! Turncoat, that's what you are. Turncoat, turncoat, cast and the turncoat. Look, I'm for hire. Anyone can buy my services if they want. Yeah, you like a whore, that's what you are. A dirty little whore, you sleeving cannot, you sleeving cannot. Well, more often than not, I found myself arguing the toss in court with my good friend, Jimmy. Well, maybe he wasn't as hard up as I was. But at the indestructible age of 26, he fell victim to typhoid. Yeah. As did his lovely young wife, Rosaline. She perished alongside him, and I caught it too from his deathbed, but my Annette, she nursed me back to life with the, pro with the benevolence of providence. Yes. Anyway, there was an awful lot going on to take my mind off him. Yes. It was a time of great agitation in the land. <laughs> when has it ever been otherwise in Ireland? Yes. The growing nationalist lobby demands, counter demands, and counter, counter, counter demands until the ancient Premier Gladstone brought out his first Home Rule Bill for Ireland in 1886, <sighs> threatening to, ta to tear the infant from the mother's arms and hand it over to a, to a gang of hucksters who could no more organise a a halfpenny toss school than they could a legal government. Well, naturally, it was shut down. Of course, it was shut down, largely through the Lord's veto. But like a leprous Lazarus, it rose from the dead with the silvery sorcery of Mr. Parnell. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Now, there are some who say that Parnell is not a home ruler. I'm a tenant's writer. Give the tenants the right to live in the land, level the barriers that divide, and there'll be no necessity to retain English mismanagement of our affairs. The only successful thing the English ever did in Ireland was to plant religious suspicion. Now, we welcome all who wish to participate in the social regeneration of the country, but they must be willing to cast in their lot with their fellow Irishmen. Remember, there are five and a half millions of people in this country, enough to win their freedom if they are so determined. Parnell, ah, 
He was always going on about the romance of the land and his great silent Catholic majority, as if that was the only thing that mattered in a modern world. Well, Parnell may have been the uncrowned king of all Ireland, but a fat lot of good it did him in the end. Uh, he was on a fool's errand seeking glory among the respectable gone bean men who cast him aside like so much dross at the behest of a hypocritical clergy. Is that what we could expect from home rule? Is that right? Well, by dint of hard work and the sweat of my brow, I was sworn in as Solicitor General for Ireland and as a liberal unionist, I meant I had a Westminster seat. <laughs> the youngest man ever to hold either post, and truth to tell, I was as proud as Punch. Of course, it meant I did earn another name. Coercing Carson! Coercing Carson! Yeah, you dirty bloody turncoat, that's what you are, a turncoat. Well, more often than not, I had to have an armed guard to carry out my, my official duties representing the Crown. My boss, Arthur Balfour, said, Oh, Ned, 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 don't worry about it. It's just the times that are in it, Ned. I told him it's always the same time in Ireland. Half past sedition and a quarter to rebellion. Such is the price of ambition. I knew if I ever wanted any kind of a normal life, I'd have to leave Dublin. So I made the move to London. I may have been the Crown's highest representative in Ireland, but that got no ice in London. I'd be starting off all over again as a legal junior. Yes, and uprooting a net in the family was no easy matter, but, but just as important, it meant the parting of the ways with the Liberal Party, because they now officially backed Home Rule for Ireland. I'd be taking my seat as an Irish Unionist, oh, yeah. a hapless greenhorn at the mercy of the pack, or so they foolishly thought. <laughs> well, I tell you, my experiences as a QC in the wilds of Ireland facing down blackguards was a valuable lesson in survival. By comparison, this lot on their green leather perches waving their business papers, ah, they were nothing to me but a flock of squawking capons. Westminster politics is supposed to be the art of gentlemanly compromise. Well, I tell you something. I saw far more honesty among the tinkers at the Ballinasloe Horse Fair. My first ever speech in Parliament, well, it was almost drowned out by the brain jeers of the Irish nationalist. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Redmond's party's maudlin outburst of sentimental trouble concerning my homeland and the destruction of this realm bears no stand. If it was up to his party, they wouldn't even be members of this house. If, uh, if they got their way over my dead body, if they had their way, we can easily arrange that. Oh no, you don't. Well, you better get in line with the many before you, for I will fight this whole rule bill with my last breath down to the last ditch. But what poor eat it'll be in the first stage? Not you, you dirty scumbag traitor. Let me get my hands on him. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, may I apologise to this House for this undignified behaviour of my fellow countrymen. As per usual, when their wits deserve them, when their wits desert them, they resort to fists. And may I... Uh, Thank the Sergeant at Arms for restoring order at such an undignified melee. I'll say it again. Home rule makes no sense whatsoever. Why cut yourself off from a thriving industrial might of a world power? For what? 
identity, sovereignty, is that what it is? A lot of romantic nonsense. Mr. Parnell knew this very well, so, and he had no time for it. No time for it at all. This romantic nation, it will be the ruination of us all. Irish identity, identity is a prison of the mind, regardless of what Mr. Redmond has to say about it. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, if Mr. Carson would care to open his closed mind, ah, uh, he would see he had more in common, Mr. Speaker, with his fellow Irishman rather than division. We have no intention of, de of deserting the empire. And His Majesty knows how much we hold him dearly in our hearts. Now, all we are asking is, or demanding, I should say, is a modicum of self-devolved government. To hear Mr. Carson, you would imagine the Catholic populace of Ireland harbors a passion for revenge. Revenge for what, Mr. Carson? Revenge for what? Ah, uh, Westminster. Westminster run by a, a pack of four flushers and bottom of the deck dealers like that Winston Churchill. Well, I tell you something, he'd sell his granny so he would. You know, despite that boy's great family name, <laughs> I doubt it that anyone will ever have any kind of confidence in Winston Churchill. Mark my words. Ah, uh, give me the law any day. At least with the law, you know where you stand. It's cut and dry it. Cut and dry it. More often than not in Westminster, I had to show them my back rather than sit there and take their insults. But if all you've got is the grand gesture, what's the point of it all? What's the point of it all? My sentiments exactly, Ned. You must learn to play the Westminster game. You really must, Ned. Lady Londonderry, I was being lionized by a lady of distinction. Yes. She was wont to tell those who would listen to her that I, I was a protege. At the age of 38, I was now a protege. Ned, Ned, you really must grab things by the scruff of the neck and stop pussyfooting around. Yes, I, I, I fear you're, you're, you're too much of a lawyer ever to be a statesman. Why don't you come down to the country for the weekend? Meet some of the right people. The Conservatives are the party to help you defeat this Home Rule Bill, Ned. She held up the prospect of high office, leading the young Turks of the Conservative Party. For many letters, they really annoyed Annette. Annette never saw the importance of it all. Well, as she was wont to say herself, she never got on with them once. But riding around on horseback at country house parties did have its uses. It was the way the business was done then. And it was through the London Dairies I would make the introductions and connections that would change my life forever. Now, one particular introduction meant a return to my homeland. Um, in a spiritual manner, so to speak. All to change, thanks to the um, Marquess of Queensbury. Carson, Carson, I am being sued by a filthy Irish pervert. Your Lordship, I too am Irish. Yes, I know that, but you, 
You're one of our kind of Irishmen, yeah, you know, like Parnell, red-blooded, not like that dirty shirtlifter Wild. He turned out to be a very important client, Queensbury. Even if he was the most disagreeable, disturbed specimen of the English aristocracy I'd ever met, on or off a horse. What was it old King George III said? If you want to paste an Irishman, it's very easy to get another Irishman to turn the spit. So, it fell to me, the uh, treacherous apostate, to do the roasting of the mammy's boy, Oscar Fingal O'Flaherty Wills Wilde. Is it any wonder he came to grief trying to live up to that, that gallimaufry of names? Now, Queensbury told me that he was just trying to protect his innocent young son, Lord Alfred, from the intentions of Wilde, and his henchmen and spies had got the goods on Wilde, good and proper. By suing for a, a libel he hadn't a ghost of a chance of winning, Wilde plaited the noose for his own neck. There are some who said he was a, a poet of some distinction, even in Trinity, I remember, yes. But I never saw it. Well, but then again, the courthouse was the last place I would come across a poet, you know. But for Oscar Wilde, it was the perfect stage for making the grand gesture. But he was no Robert Emmett, believe you me, with his loose, flippant tongue in his arrogant cheek, spouting out his dirty claptrap innuendo about the goings-on of the ancient Greeks. Oh yes, it was all very cultural indeed, very cultural indeed. Wild on his favourite stage with his favourite audience of eager, young, tongue-tied Englishmen. The very same ones that he made a, a laugh of and a joke in his many plays and diversions, which I'm happy to say I never saw. Mm. Yeah, getting great laughs he was at one time, great laughs. At my expense, but not for long, not for long. Tripping him up was child's play. <laughs> he couldn't even be truthful about his age. Now that is more like a woman than a man. Poor Mahaffey. Our very erudite professor in Trinity College will be so disappointed. Disappointed that his shining star pupil, Oscar Wilde, will be brought low by the plodder, Ned Carson. I just thank the Lord I didn't have to use that stuff that, that Queensbury had dug up. But he wanted to throw it all on the open court, despite the fact that it, it showed his lovely young son Albert, or uh, Bosey as he was known, not in a good light indeed. Well, I tell you something, that Bosey, you know, in Dublin he'd be known as a right Bosey, so he would. Oscar Wilde, well. He came to grief thinking that his eloquent Hibernian charm would be enough to excuse the inexcusable. And like many an Irishman past and present, he would come to grief, yes, thinking that um, English fair play was a universal right to one and all. Still, I suppose I should pay him some kind of a backhanded compliment. After all, if he, because he was so besotted by his spoiled English aristocrat, who knows? I might have had to go back to Dublin to earn a crust, because up to then it had been very much touch and go. Touch and go indeed. This would of course made Annette very happy and the family. Now, so I must pay him some form of back 
handed compliment. It occurred to me many years later that, you know, fanciful thinking that Oscar Wilde, the um, disgraced Irish sodomite, would come to play uh, not an insignificant part in the foundation of the new state of Northern Ireland. Although I doubt such a fanciful notion would gain much credence among the marching brethren of the dark Morn Mountains. By 1904, the second Home Rule Bill for Ireland had been rejected once more by the Commons. But acceptance for it was growing and growing and growing. My feeble fellow unionists were on the point of political extinction, largely due to the fact that they couldn't take decisive action. And by 1909, an urgent letter from Mr. James Craig of the Ulster Unionist Council got my immediate attention. The offer of a partnership of me as leader, him as backroom organizer. Now, truth to tell, I knew very little of the Unionists of the North. We'd always been put off a bit by the North, the radicalism of the North. But I remember that these were the descendants of such great Irish leaders such as Henry Joy McCracken, that I so admired in my days at Trinity. Yes. Oh, I knew what political baggage I was taking on. We outsiders always looked askance at Ulster, when the annual unrolling of the old rags and orange mummy got an airing each summer. I had to ask myself, what had I got in common with these fellow Irishmen, with their unique fears and tribulations? So before I agreed to anything, I told them I needed to know just how far they were prepared to go. I remember one time my boss, Arthur Balfour, uh, spoke to me about, the, um, about dealing with what he called the noisy Protestants of the North, Ned. You know, it's that confused way they have of speaking. It's neither Irish nor Scottish. That it's easy to misinterpret their intentions, you know. My first ever visit to Belfast was in 1911. I had no idea what to expect. We rode in an open car, my wife and I, through James Craig's estate. We detoured through the markets area down to the shipyards. And there, lying at anchor, was the recently launched Titanic. Oh, I marveled at this mammoth feat of modern engineering, and I said, oh, it'll go on to conquer the seven seas, bearing the proud red ensign of Great Britain and the Empire. My wife, Annette, uh, gently nudged me in the ribs and drew my attention down to the black painted helm. Just above the waterline was chalked the legend, no Pope here. A timely reminder. Waiting for us at the field was an enormous crowd. Enormous. Waiting for us. When James Craig made the introduction, a great cheer went up and swelled around the quiet countryside, reinforced by the echo of drums. These drums were the very heartbeat of blind fealty to the Ulster Defence Association. And it was my turn to speak. I mounted the platform and looked out over the multitude of upturned faces. Not what you call a typical unionist crowd, I thought. No, 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 no. These were more like a, 
a working class tribe out in their Sunday best to flat cap and bowl their hat. And, it, and then it suddenly dawned on me that maybe it was I, the Dublin dandy, was being held up to them for inspection rather than the other way round. But there was nothing misty-eyed about these evangelical men, their obdurate features. These very modern Irishmen had put their modern Irish city, Belfast, on the map of the world through their industry and foundry and shipyards. A great bunch of loyal Irishmen who cheered me to the rafters when I addressed them so. These, these were the very men that I needed as ammunition in my fight against that insidious bill being foisted on us by Westminster. The Union is my lone star, and I will kill this bill if it is the last thing I ever do. I watched all those upturned faces hanging on my every word. And then, ringing in my ears, was the plangent sound of James Craig's voice. A Protestant parliament for a Protestant people. I watched, I watched as the standards were blessed by all the Protestant churches of the North. I knew then that if Ulster succeeds, home rule is dead. The next year, 1912, I spent hosting meetings and lectures up and down England. I, and I had to retire to my bed, suffering from nervous exhaustion. That was when James Craig came to me with an idea. A gigantic moratorium. Something to get the numbers out. A sort of a, a Magna Carta for Ulster to be signed. Something that could not be ignored getting the numbers out. I wasn't sure about it, I mean, if it would be. Had I lost faith in James Craig? Well, Belfast was to surprise me yet again. And I became the first of the many thousands to sign that document. Yes, it became a, a historical event in the life of that city. And huge though it was, it, it did only amount to a minority of people in the, in the north of Ireland. And uh, in England, well, in England they had Ascot, Henley, and the cricket. No contest. And even though it was only a minority on the whole island of Ireland, and that was including the ladies, well, shall I say, the women's lesser signatures. Churchill, of course, had his say. He would definitely say. This spurious document is a perversion of the spirit of Ronnie Mead. And Carson, putting his imprimatur on it, shows how adept he is at obeying his new master's wishes when they pull upon his leash. The orange tail will go on wagging the Ulster dog, and there'll be no peace on the streets of Belfast until that particular cur is foxed once and for all. 1913, the government was passing the last stages of the Home Rule Bill into law. But I was not there. 
I was not there to hear the Irish nationalists cheer down the conspiratorial corridors. Instead, I was at home, at the deathbed of my wife, who'd asked me to hold her in her last hours. My wife of over 30 years perished that day. The two imperishable loves of my life died that day. By 1914, it was all done and dusted, leading to a terrible turn of events in Ulster. The nightmare made real had slipped the bonds of Protestant control and was manifesting itself in violence. The new leaders in the South were not in any mood to water down their hard-won demands. To them, the future looked like a bright, shining hope. To the Protestants of Ulster, they saw it as perhaps a servitude as second-class citizens. And so, the gun-running plot was put into action. Of course, when Churchill got wind of it, he had his say. This is what we could expect from these so-called bluffers and bigots. They would rather shoot than vote. Now, James Craig had told me that the UVF were fed up with exercising with dummy rifles. And it would be his way of keeping control of the situation. And the arms would be a diversion for the orange man. One particular orange card proved to be a valuable one in these days. He proved to be one of my most ardent fanatic disciples. Fred Crawford, yes. Fred put the blame on everything on Gladstone, who brought out the first Home Rule Bill in 86. To such a degree, Fred had thought it would be a good idea to kidnap the ancient Prime Minister, and he had put certain things into strategic operation. But he reluctantly had to abandon them because of his inability to find a suitable loyalist bolt hole in that sharse part of London, as he had it. Well, Fred, he was the man, he was the instrument wherein we, loyal unionists, would cross the line of passive resistance into actual treason against His Majesty's government. By bringing in illegal weapons, we would be committing treason. So, with the connivance of the Kaiser's Secret Service, 25,000 rifles were got. Yes. And for the best part of a dark and sweaty week, we thought Fred would be intercepted and arrested. But no. The weapons were landed. The weapons were landed. The Rubicon had been crossed. We were now prepared to throw the whole of Ireland into a war rather than obey the legal government in Westminster. Fortunately, outside effects came into play. With the suspension of Home Rule during the duration of the First World War. 
Now, First World War, when Irishmen, North and South, flocked to defense of all the small nations against bigger bullies. Yes, leaving, leaving a small coterie of them, um, so-called um, patriots, in Dublin in 1916 to stab us in the back. But they got the comeuppance with the population spitting on them, which they well deserved. And yet, within 18 months, 18 months, These were being held up as heroes, patriotic heroes, and they swung the last All-Ireland election for their leaders. The result was Sinn Féin, 72, the rest, 26. I thought the country had lost its mind. I thought it had lost its mind, but no. They would not be taking their seats in Westminster. Oh dear, no, 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 no. Instead, they sent me an invitation. The impertinence signed in Irish and in English from their leader, uh, Arthur Griffiths, to the formation of a sovereign Irish government in the Mansion House at Dublin. Well, I'll hold on to that souvenir to throw back in their face when they come back cup in hand yes begging to be taken back after they make a hames of things and the new american ambassador over the clam chowder in windsor castle to his majesty saying well, you know, it's, um, it is the democratic will of the Irish people, sir. The democratic will. Well, I can tell you now that that election result will not be accepted in the North. They will not be coerced into a, a, into a government by their enemies as they saw it. No, sir. They will not accept it. So bloodshed was on the cards unless something could be done to exempt Ulster. Even His Majesty could not get, get the two parties to agree to anything. Finally, it was accepted. At first, the whole of the ancient province of Ulster was quite rightly demanded. But on second thought, after some consideration, uh, well, it, it came down to a six-county entity. That could be manageable. Yes, that could be manageable. However, the Unionist delegates from Cavan, Monaghan and Donegal came to me with tears in their eyes, beseeching me, begging me to be included, wanting to know why, why, why were we being excluded? Why were we being discriminated against? Why can't we be excluded? It was carefully explained to them that with their large mixed populations, the Unionist vote could be easily overturned at the next election. Your sacrifice is for the Unionist cause. That's what you will get. So, an agreement was signed, sealed, and delivered, allowing for a rapprochement to be made when both parties were ready to meet. So after all my wheeling and dealing, scheming and plotting and threats of bloodshed and everything, we ended up with home rule. Not once, twice! So here we are today. 1921. 
an anteroom in Belfast City Hall. The formation of the first Northern Irish government. <sighs> an air of uncertainty about everything. People whispering, nobody talking, until somewhere there was a slurred voice it was heard. Well, looks like we won anyway. <laughs> and it was kind of as if they had lit the blue paper fuse. And then there was a further laugh and more laughter. And then down the years, Jimmy Shannon's laughter came back to me laughing. Was this still me, the sea green, incorruptible? We all start off so sure of ourselves. How do we end? Well, reality was re-established by, in a typical Ulster fashion, well, by a the gentle tapping of a teaspoon on a teacup. James Craig called for attention, turned to me, and he made the offer. Prime Minister. And I made the arranged reply and refused. I looked around all the uncertain faces and I said, well, no, no, no. It's time for somebody younger, somebody fresher, I said. But, well, truth to tell, inside I was glad it was over. Glad. Well, Belfast has never been my city. And these were never really my people. Except by political inclination, of course. So, Time for all the goodbyes and Carson's last speech. We used to say that we could not trust an Irish parliament in Dublin to do justice to the Protestant minority. Let us take care that that reproach cannot be made against your parliament here in Belfast. You must show the world, from the outset, that the Catholic minority in Northern Ireland have nothing to fear from a Protestant majority. To, su to secure trust, you must build on reputation and cooperation. It's your duty to see that you manage this mandate that has been handed to you in this first instance, so that it becomes a true and democratic expression of all the people under your governance. For if you fail, it will be removed for correction by the higher power of this union, a union that you have set above all others. I thank you. We'll sing you a song and make a fuss, whoever you are, you're one of us. If you're Irish, this is the place.